What an extraordinary honour it is to be here, to stand on this country, on this Ghana country, knowing that thousands of generations of artists have stood here before me, that for thousands of generations people have sung their songs here, danced their dances here, told their stories, poured their very selves, their very essence into this country. I'm incredibly grateful to stand here. I'm incredibly grateful to all of the artists who have gone before us in this place. And I'm incredibly grateful to all of you for your art, for your generosity, for the way that you hold our stories and that you keep them for future generations. Because that's the thing so much. Even when we talk about the here and now, for us it's often not about the here and now. For us it is about what we're holding for those who come after. That's been very much the story of my life. It's been very much a history of narrative that is driven, because we remember the stories, the stories they live with us, because that's the thing about the stories. If we don't give them away, if we don't share them, they stagnate, they die and they stop. So I'm incredibly honoured to be here in this place of story. Thank you, Uncle Michael, for that extraordinary welcome this morning. With great humility, I will use aspects of my own Yorta Yorta language here today. I do that with great respect for this country, for its people, for its histories, and I hope it is taken as such. I started wondering what it means to talk about here and now. You see, I often don't live in the here and now. I live in the past or I live in the future. And those two things influence what I'm doing here and now. But more so, they keep me looking forwards. And in keeping, I think, with our last session, so much of that for me has been about family. I looked at things very differently when I became a father myself, and I'll come to that a little bit more presently. But first, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to go back. That's me. A little smaller than I am now. <laughs> and I just noticed upon looking at those photos this morning that I'm wearing socks with sandals. <laughs> and I intend to go back to Melbourne and have a word with my mother about this. <laughs> I was five years old, I can't be held responsible for my fashion choices. This is me heading off to school five years old, off to Knox Park Primary School. I was the only Koori kid in the entire school, well, the only Koori kid who identified in the entire school. There were rumours about some of the other ones. But you see, I'd grown up with a privilege. I'd grown up with a black privilege. I knew who I was, I knew my country, I knew my family, I'd had those stories told to me, and I fully acknowledge that that is not a privilege that has necessarily been afforded to all other First Peoples in this continent. And I further assert that it's not their fault. It's not that somehow we lost our identity like it fell down the back of the sofa with the remote control for the TV. There have been protracted efforts to separate us and keep us from our story, to stop our stories being told. And it's only through the privilege that I had in my family that so much of that was kept alive and I could keep telling those stories. But you see, when I went, to primary school, hell, when I went to high school later on, there was a disturbing and pervasive narrative that was given to me about Aboriginal culture in the southeast of the continent. And there was a specific word that was used, and that word was extinct. That was the word that was used. When I went to primary school, when I went to high school, I was told Aboriginal people in the southeast of Australia were extinct. Our languages were no longer spoken, our dances were no longer danced, our culture was gone. Sometimes we were told we were lucky that it had been recorded by ethnographers and anthropologists, but that we as a people were no more. And I remember sitting in the classroom and I could feel the gaze of 30 other young people in the back of my head. I was sitting right down the front left-hand corner. And as I turned to look and take in the room of all of my contemporaries, 
they gave me this look. Some of them who were sympathetic, some of them who were just bigoted, it was the 1980s. The sympathetic ones looked at me with their heads cocked to one side. Poor Tyrakey. Doesn't realise it's extinct. <laughs> and I remember the feeling, well, I thought I was angry. Well, I'm still angry now. I just hide it behind a mask of low-key self-deprecating humour. <laughs> but I was angry, but at the same time, I looked back at those people and I felt tremendous pity for them. Because I knew I wasn't extinct. My life was full of these extraordinary experiences and people's stories that I was getting told on a daily basis. You know, I spent half my life sleeping on a couch because of the extraordinary people that were coming through my house that I had to give my bed up for. There were artists coming from the central desert, from the top end, people like Michael Nelson Jagamara, Ginger Riley, my own adopted Murungun Jinang grandfather, who's old Jack, whose name we can't say anymore. Well, it's my name now, but I don't use it yet. I slept on the couch in the same way that my father had been forced to sleep in the bath as a kid to give up his bed for Albert Namajira. I had these greats, these extraordinary activists coming through the house. Indeed, 50 years ago, would have had the last one of these gatherings. My uncle Bruce, Martin Bartfeld, my father Lynn made one of their first films, A Time to Dream, with, of course, the extraordinary uncle Harold Blair, bringing the national black theatre to Canberra. These were stories that I knew, but no one else in the room knew me, knew them. And increasing, increasingly lately, it's given me pause to start thinking about that experience, about what it actually means, and start thinking that whilst I did pity those around me, perhaps I also took the wrong tack at the time. because I realise that the same low expectations that have been applied to me and my family and my experience, I was, I was applying externally as well. So this seems as good a forum as any to say, I, I probably feel like I probably should offer a formal apology on my part to white Australia. <laughs> to say I've spent the best of the la part of the last 40 years treating you with low expectations thinking that you were not capable of deep, profound cultural insight and learnings. And believing that in perhaps in your limited way, you could learn a fraction of this, but you weren't necessarily open or capable. I realise now that that was wrong, and I give myself permission to expect more. Because you see, as I was being told these stories, I knew there was another narrative. And I learned gradually to speak more and more of this story. I knew that in the music hall, in the circus tent, the stories, the language, the culture, the dance, the history, which was illegal to practice, was kept alive. I knew that if you couldn't outwardly tell these stories, teach your children these dances, I knew there was a history of extraordinary practitioners who hid in plain sight, who put these stories on a stage in front of thousands, called it a performance, and all of a sudden you were able to maintain culture and practice and history. And sometimes you were lucky enough to get paid to do it even. I work now at the University of Melbourne. I'm head of the Willen Centre for Indigenous Arts and Cultural Development at the Victorian College of the Arts. Ultimately, I tend to think I'm just an artist, but luckily I turned up on the right day 15 years ago and hung around long enough till everyone else left. <laughs> True story. I am still an artist, but I'm in a place where I get to practice art and I get to tell these stories. And perhaps more importantly now, I get to share these stories and I get to communicate my expectations to other people in this space too. That on these stages, our stories have been kept. Performative activism and performative resistance have defined so much of our family histories. And these were the stories I grew up on. I'm very pleased that Narita's here. 
Uh, that Nerida's here to see. I, I didn't know you were going to be here, but of course there's a bunch of Uncle Harold stuff, and indeed extraordinary footage, which I don't have with me today, of, of Uncle Harold singing in Canberra those 50 years ago. I remember, I'm going to digress for a moment, talk amongst yourselves. I remember a great story that my dad always used to tell of your dad, where he would, your dad was working with, with my grandfather Bill at the time, and dad had shops in Narbathong, just over here, and in Port, in, sorry, in Port Augusta, just over here, in Narbathong, in Belgrave. And he was employing, in the 1950s, a huge swathe of black artists and, indeed, white people that worked for him. I don't imagine there were many, many gabbas, many migaloo, many white people in, uh, in the 1950s that say they, could say they worked for a black fellow. But Uncle Harold Blair used to do some work for my grandfather when he wasn't out performing, and he would drive between the different shops delivering stock, or even as to when they used to, smuggling stock off mission stations that were less friendly about allowing it to be sold openly. I remember my father talking about this. He'd sit there with Uncle Harold Blair. Uncle Harold would drive down the road singing as he went. And here was my father, 16 years of age or something, world-renowned opera singer in the car there with him, blasting away. And to my father's great and, and, and eternal shame, sitting there thinking, oh, God, Uncle Harold, shut up. <laughs> Can't we have the radio? <laughs> Years later, he apologised deeply for this, and so I felt I must pass that on again as well. <laughs> Sorry for all that. He learned his lesson later. But you see, there were these extraordinary moments, like Mumba. Again, Uncle Harold all over. Georgia Lee from up in the Torres Strait, the extraordinary work they did. These are the stories that I was brought up on. I'd been regaled with these histories of performative resistance. And they informed so much of who I was and my understanding of how this history of culture and practice was not only for us, but that it humanised us in the eyes of a colonial system which had sought to make us inhuman for so very, very long. And yet, the narrative that was shared with little socks and sandals Cherokee in the classroom was one of deficit and extinction. And those well-meaning people that looked at me with pity in their eyes had no ideas of what, what they'd missed out on. And I began to ask myself, well, where are their heroes? Because I would argue that they were there. That we have had people who have put aside their privilege or chosen to mobilise their privilege to amplify the voice of, of Aboriginal Australia, to be allies, meaningful allies in that space. But their stories weren't told either. And I'd grown up with them around me too. I'm fortunate to still have them around me now. A lot of the cultural maintenance that's been done in my family has been done by women over the last few generations who haven't necessarily come from here. I'm ashamed to admit that my partner, who is Amanda, who is Welsh and amazing and extraordinary, probably speaks more and better yoda yoda than I do. She's maintained that and held that space. My old Scottish grandmother would sit with my grandfather Bill and make word lists that they would then copy out and post out to government officials, to businesses, everywhere, saying, these might be some nice names for you to use for such and such. Trying to keep language and culture present and always pervasive and always holding an authority of voice. And that was the question that I started to be led back to, is where does the authority of voice sit in these conversations? We have a great history of appropriation and extraction. And as Aboriginal people, we're, we're really, really, really good at being the subjects of, of other people's research. Increasingly now, though, we have more of the stories being told, the extraordinary histories of resilience and strength and vitality. I find myself asking, well, who is bringing the authority? And even for me, I don't live in my traditional country. I live on Kulin Nations country, yes, but I live on Unwarung country, and Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country. I'm a guest there. What's my role there in mobilising the privileges that I've been given to amplify that story of place? And if the authority of that conversation sits with me, should it? And the answer oftentimes is, well, probably not. Ultimately, the authority comes from some other direction, comes from my elders, from others who have told me, Bubby, I'd quite like to have, which means you go out and you do that now, 
anyone who knows Naomi Carolyn Briggs will know that she's excellent at that. These weren't stories of exclusion that I was given. On those weekends away from that school, I wasn't told those stories. I was told stories of strength. I was encouraged to see the histories, to share in those strengths of place. These are my great, 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 great grandparents. King Billy and Queen Mary of the Waveru, they're right there in the thick of invasion. These photos are taken when they were herded into studios to be photographed and recorded as the last vestiges of a dying race. They met walking their country. They met, their granddaughter met her future husband at a bogong moth harvest in Mount Beauty, one of the last bogong moth harvests that our family ever attended. They still practiced trade, they still told their stories. And even when they, were, when they were pushed onto mission stations and those stories were suppressed, they kept telling them and in other ways. This is the last photographic evidence I have of a member of my family with their bigung, their possum skin cloak. That all pervasive aspect of culture and identity, probably no better a representation of physical cultural practice for us in the southeast than that bigunga, as we say in Yorta another place in Jaja Warang country, it's Jukum Jukum in, in Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung and Bun Wurrung, it's, it's Wallet Wallet. So many different names that signify that same thing, a piece of cultural identity that we wear on our very selves, that we don't claim for ourselves, but rather which is given to us. But then that story stopped. There's photos of my great-great-great-grandmother in a summer wearing a floral mission dress with flowers in her hair, taken in the same studio. That story stopped then. But it did not end then. Because you see, that story kept getting told on in our family. And indeed, about 30 years ago, I sat in country not far from here on one of our many pilgrimages that we would go on, from Kulin country down in the southeast all the way up to Murungun Jinan country in central Arnhem land where my adopted grandfather and other family up there were waiting for us. And on the way, we'd collect treasures. And Dad and I would sit at the, on the side of the road at night, skinning possums and plucking birds and things that we'd found on the road throughout the day. I only learnt recently that it was technically illegal. I still do it, but, you know. but don't tell anyone. But he would tell me stories about how once upon a time, Ayanbana, our old people, had worn their big younger. And about how his father had done the same thing with him, sitting there, skinning possums, telling these stories. That they'd never got enough skins together to make a cloak, but that one day he promised me it would happen again, because the important thing was that we told these stories. And they sat with me for a good 30 years or so, until I started to find space and time in life. When my daughter Ninda was born, I wrapped her in a bigunga, in a possum skin cloak. Part of her culture and identity that was once thought to be completely lost. She's the first in our family in seven generations to be wrapped in that, to be told, Domeniniyalka, my dear sweet child. She came along at just the right time. Because this was when I just started to find space in my life. You see, I'd had these dreams of bringing the cloaks back. I won a fellowship at the University of Melbourne called the Hutchinson Indigenous Fellowship. And I was asked what I'd do. I said, well, I'd like to make a big anger a cloak, but that old way. Because I believe that like a puzzle, those pieces are still out there. Someone's going to know how to work this in you. Someone's going to know how to cure those skins up, the raw skins, proper way. Someone will know how to make the rapture, the muscle shell knives. If we go and we start looking, it will come out of the woodwork. And so I started talking to people. And every single person I talked to said the same thing. They said, oh, I, 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 I was going to do that. I was going to make one of those other clothes. I said, well, that's fine. Come, we'll do it together. Like, these people, <laughs> these people are giving me money. I, I can't spend it on me. 
I don't own any of this. It wasn't right for me to hold the authority. You see, just because I had the privilege and the space didn't mean it was mine. I had to give it away, and I do have to give it away. And that's the beautiful thing about being an artist and practice is that the more we give away, the more we get at the end of the day. And I think that's one of the fundamental things that our old people have understood for those thousands and thousands of generations, is that that's how we ultimately make ourselves strong. So I collected a bunch of possum skins. Not at the side of the road this time, I found a possum farm in, in Tasmania. Let him meet. John, the lovely chap there, was, was kind enough to sell me raw skins throughout the back of the possum. Wasn't quite sure what I wanted them for, but was willing to do it. And so we started working with them. There's my mother, Jo, furiously cranking the handle of the hill's hoist. So furious, in fact, that with her next stroke, she actually breaks the handle clean off. <laughs> and that was the end of my old green hill's hoist. It's gone now, but not forgotten. I thought it was this wonderful moment of decolonising as well, taking a great icon of white Australia as the hill's hoist and covering it <laughs> with my curing possum skins. And indeed, in homage to my own father, Lynn Onis, and his bats on the hill's hoist sculpture, which is in the art gallery of New South Wales. It's nice that we carry these things on. And I started sharing these practices. We started running workshops, just saying possum skin cloak making workshops, all welcome. Over 100 people came in and out of these spaces over, over the course of that day. That's my noble savage photo in the bottom right hand corner there. When you uh, turn up to be photographed, if you've made a possum cloak and they've organised a, you know, <clears throat> a photo shoot for you, bear in mind that people may have different expectations to what you did. I turned up in a suit and um, somehow by the end of it I ended up standing just over the car park in the Bond Beach car park with my shirt off wrapped in cloak, making it look like I was out there in the bush. In, in my natural habitat. <laughs> it gradually kind of progressed, but there was something about... It was that literally the first time I'd worn it, and there was something about wearing that story right against your skin as well. From that, we started running workshops in communities everywhere. I didn't really want to at first. I hadn't intended to set myself up as any kind of authority, and I still don't seek that authority, but people, more and more people, wanted to hold that space as well, wanted to share in those stories. More and more people needed that. This is a community cloak made out at Sunbury on the, um, the right-hand side of the picture there. Nani Maxine, who's definitely allergic to possums, I'll point out, is wearing a red rain poncho, a mask and gloves. I was too scared to tell her not to come. <laughs> she came. She had to pop out one day to go to the hospital, be in a respiratory group. She came straight back. <laughs> this has been the beautiful thing, though. I've been able to mobilise my privilege and share these stories again. And as an artist, I find myself now in the enviable space of actually being able to do this as a job. That there are people in this world stupid enough to pay me to do the things I do for free. But I've also come to realise that in this space, as we work together, as we seek to position ourselves, consultation and collaboration, words that have been bandied around a lot, are no longer sufficient, if they ever were. It's allyship that really gets to me now, that speaks to the thrivance of our culture. Restoring the structures of how we have interacted, because the law of this country, had it been observed two and a half centuries ago when people first invaded, I imagine, had that been observed, we would be having very different conversations in rooms like this now. I'm incredibly fortunate to be able to live in that space of allyship. I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the love and the diplomacy that have been shown to me by those who speak for place, that allow me to stand on country and speak, that allow me to make my work where I'm able to contribute to so many different communities. And it's brought me here with you all. And it's brought me here in my journey and in my story as well. That it's seven generations between my great-great-great-great-grandparents and my daughters, Ninda, Yelene and Lakora, all born with their biganga. But in the grand scheme of over 3,000 different generations of practice and culture and story and history and place. It's 
Seven generations of not doing something is that. That's just a blink of the eye for the creator. There's something lovely and comforting for me about not being the rocky island out there in the ocean, but being a grain of sand on that beach of artists and practitioners that have gone in this place for so long. It's why I start by thanking the artists and those around me. It's why I'm going to end with thanking you for all that you've done in this place, because the strength, the thrivance of our identity, our stories, our culture and our history. The fact that I'm able to think so much. I realise that yesterday we talked about legacy, tomorrow we look to the future and I wonder what stories my girls will be telling when that future comes. But in the here and now, I know that those stories are vibrant, they thrive, they inform me of who I am and they aid in my refusal of the colonial project on a daily basis. So regardless of who we are, where we sit politically in this spectrum, what we think we should be doing, I thank you as artists for your stories, for the strength that it gives me. I thank you for the role that you play in the thrivance and the strength of our culture and identity. And I sincerely, sincerely dream and look forward to that future where others will look back at the stories that we have shared now and which we continue to share and think of themselves how privileged and how fortunate. It has been an extraordinary. Thank you so much for, for having me here for this space. <laughs>